Hello everyone and welcome to this virtual 747-400 walkthrough. Ken and I work for Pentest Partners in the UK and we've been very fortunate to have access to end-of-life airframes at a breakers yard from which we've learned an awful lot and we look forward to sharing some of these things with you, especially if you've never seen the inside of Avionics Bay before. So here we are walking up the stairs to door B2, which is the second from the front on the starboard side and gives us a nice view back over the wing. The observant amongst you will probably notice that there are some engines missing. There should be four, but three have already been sold on as these tend to be the most expensive and sought after components. On board now and we're straight into one of the galley areas and this will be where the ground services teams load those trolleys full of your drinks and in-flight meals. But sadly, no fine dining today as the aircraft is basically pretty empty of everything except the seats. Let's firstly walk through to the back of the aircraft, past the stairs to the upper deck. The 747 is truly a monster, it's 71 metres long, that's 230 feet, so there's plenty of space on this aircraft for a full class cabin layout. Down here, right at the back, is the first of our secret areas, which is in fact the crew rest area. One of two, this is primarily for the cabin crew. Through this door at the back are some vaguely comfy seats and then a small spiral stair leading up to the crew bunk area. Back up to the pointy end now and first class and towards the back of this section is perhaps the lesser known four axis hatch down into the electrical engineering or avionics bay. You won't find this kind of access in smaller aircraft though. You can just see the outside hatch is open as well down below at the bottom of this ladder. Let's climb down into the avionics bay then. This is our main set of avionics, all neatly racked up. Each black box carries out an individual function and are called line replaceable units, or LRUs. For example, here we have LRUs for cabin heating control, data management, and at the bottom, the three inertial reference units for navigation. Looking at the same rack from the other side, now we can see big bundles of cabling running from the back of the racks to other areas, mostly to the cockpit, which is now two decks above us. Each individual LRU will have discrete cabling up to the switches or displays in the cockpit, and if needed, discrete cabling to any other LRUs it needs to talk to. Most of the cables carry data in the ARINC 429 protocol on this aircraft, and this needs a pair for both transmit and receive. There is no network in the traditional sense to connect to. You can't just clip into a pair of wires at the back of the aircraft and gain access to all of these other LRUs. Perhaps fortunately, it doesn't work like that on these older aircraft. One other little secret is that behind the LRU rack are doors leading to the forward cargo bay. The cargo and avionics bay are pressurised, and although it would be pretty cold and noisy, you could, in theory, use this area in flight, but I really wouldn't want to. This aircraft has huge tanks of water in here now, and this is because with the engines removed, it would be too tail heavy and would actually fall backwards without the equivalent weight. Let's take a closer look at one of these LRUs. This particular one is for the paravisual display, an indicator which shows the pilots if they're aligned on the runway. They're held onto a standard size rack with a screw thread and rubber vibration mount. Some LIEs have more than one locking screw. If we pull these out, we find a custom multi-pin connector on the back of the LIU for a cable breakout. This will then run off to wherever it needs to go in the cockpit. Here we have two of the units involved with ACARS, which is the aircraft's data link system. The CMU acts like a router sending ACARS traffic between the various radios and the output devices like display units and printers, which we'll see later. OK, let's follow those cables back upstairs via a fairly unique set of stairs to the upper deck bubble. There's a galley up here too, if you remember that for later. Right at the front, we find the cockpit behind the armoured doors. Mm -hmm. 
Here we are in the cockpit then. On the left is the captain's seat and to the right is the first officer's. There are two jump seats as well and behind me is the flight crew rest area, just a bunk bed again, and a separate toilet that they can use without going back into the passenger area. On long flights there will be three pilots, or more, which they rotate through so someone is always getting some rest. The Dash 400 was the first 747 with a glass cockpit in that the flight instruments are screens rather than what are termed steam-driven dials and gauges. It would have been a flight engineer too, but their role is now computerised for the most part. Each pilot has their own control column or yoke, which is directly connected to the control services by wires, pulleys and gears on a Boeing. The centre console is mostly taken up with the multifunction control and display units, throttles and controls for the radios. They also have a primary flight display right ahead of them and a navigational display. Both are independent. In the centre are the ICAS, engine indicating and crew alerting system displays, which show the status of all the major systems like engines, fuel, electrics, hydraulics, and also comes up with a log style set of messages in yellow or red, depending on severity. So let's power up. We have a single ground power unit available. We should have two really for a 747, so we need to be a bit careful on power use. By pressing the overhead button to tie in ground power one, most things come alive. You'll notice there's definitely no key. After a few minutes, the primary flight display, showing the artificial horizon and flight director bars, and the navigational display, come up. Here I'm sat in the first officer's seat on the right, so the primary flight display is on the right, and the navigational display on the left. My lower ICAST display shows the electrical buses, one for each engine, but as you can see from the upper display, we have three engines missing. The aircraft will think there's a fire, as the detection loops aren't connected, but obviously we're not really on fire. I can also use my MCDU to access the ACAR system that we saw downstairs in the avionics bay. There are lots of things I can do through ACARs, but that's the topic for another of my talks. Also in the cockpit are some other interesting bits of avionics, like this navigation database loader that still uses 3.5 inch floppy disks. This database has to be updated every 28 days, so you can see how much of a chore this must be for an engineer to visit each month. There is also a quick access recorder, which is used for gathering lots of data about the aircraft's health. At the end of each flight, or near enough, an engineer will remove the PC card, although this one actually has a CF to PC card converter, and download the data, which helps with predictive maintenance or detecting if there's been a heavy landing or tail strike, for example. More and more aircraft are starting to become E-enabled, which means this data is streamed in near real time back to the airlines and engine makers over SATCOM, so they can have replacement parts ready and waiting for when the aircraft next lands. Now then, in-flight entertainment. There's no Wi-Fi on this 747, but under the stairs, down from the upper deck, the cabin services director has a small office, and this is where the 747's IFE is driven from. There is a small touchscreen PC here, which is actually running NT4. This can be used to change aspects of the system, add the day's news broadcast video, reboot seat boxes, and even turn individual seat lights on and off. Above this are the digital media servers themselves, which contain all the movies and so on, ready to stream to each seat. There's also the boarding music and safety announcement controller, which just plays off digital audio tape. There's even a little printer in here, which is linked to the ACAR system, so the cabin services director can print things off if they need to. And lastly, I want to leave you with a little secret. Remember the upper galley? Well, there's a lift to take catering cars between the main and the upper deck, which is pretty cool. Alex, thank you for the tour of the 747. Absolutely fascinating. Now, now why didn't you do this interview in the, in the 74 itself? Well, yeah, we really should have done, but it was a bit, you know, kind of confined in there and in the current COVID environment. 
doing it with masks and things would have been a bit weird. So yeah, we've we've come back to do it in the sim. So it's our simulator rather than the the cockpit of uh, the seven four seven. Sadly, that's fine. Great. Yeah. Safety first, right? Quite right too. Now, yeah. um, you know, one of the things that um, I think is, is is a bit of a game changer is the fact that so many airframes are being retired right now. What, what difference does that make for us as researchers? Aircraft themselves are really expensive piece, you know, and even if you had the all the will in the world, um, airlines and airframe manufacturers won't just let you go and pen test an aircraft. Um, because you don't really know what state you're going to leave it in. It's not like an office network um, where you can go and reinstall and clean things up. Recertifying avionics and whole airframes is ludicrously expensive. And even if you were able to have some assurance that you've cleaned up the mess the pen tester has left. So um, being able to sort of do uh, more adversarial testing of an aircraft um, in a flying state is not something that we really get to be able to do. Um, so, you know, it's not a silver lining, I have to say, but one of the results of the COVID crisis and, and um, is that airlines are bringing forward a lot of their scrapping programs, um, particularly of these larger types like the 747 um, and the 380s. Um, and as a result, they're, they're going to salvage yards. Um, they're not really going to fly again in their, their current state. Um, no one really wants 747s anymore. Um, so yes, the avionics um, may get um, a, a second lease of life, um, but the, the actual aircraft themselves are unlikely to be able to fly again. And that gives us a really good opportunity to go and have a poke around. Yeah, so we in the past we've looked at um, airframes. I think probably the oldest one we got to have a play with was a, a 10-year-old A320 or so. But even then, it's, it doesn't really represent what's coming off the production line right now, does it? So, you know, no. last year for DEFCON for the village, we went and bought some some LRUs, uh, but even those were upwards of 20 years old. So, it, do you think it's 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 a game changer the fact that we're seeing some slightly more recent kit being uh, scrapped or decommissioned? Yeah, for sure. I mean, the, the, the 74 that we just did the video to around was 23 years old. But remember that the design life cycle, life cycle of these things is 30 years. Um, there's a decade or more of design work that goes into an aircraft before it even goes into production and then 20 odd years of service. So what people are designing today um, will still be in service in 30 years time. And it's really difficult um, to anticipate all of sort of future security needs and requirements. So, um, yeah, what we've seen today is obviously not state of the art. And there are differences between a um, 747 that we looked at and more modern aircraft like the 380 that are flying today. Big differences in the way that their um, avionics are set up and how the networking is done on board. Yeah, so it's it's important to remember that particular plane was still flying, what, just over two, two and a half months ago? And I think yeah. I actually flew in that very plane as a passenger uh, last year. So yeah, it, it is representative. It's just uh, yeah. the uh, scrappage programs are being accelerated. And I also went through the avionics bay, actually dating the install dates from many of the components. And there's a lot of kit in there that is only five to ten years old in some cases. So it's not all 23 years out of date. No, no, and a lot of it is reused. Um, so the, the ground proximity warning system, um, for example, those LRUs are pretty much interchangeable between any aircraft. I mean, I've seen the same exact LRU make a model um, on the 74 as I did an Airbus A320, um, and they go for $20,000. I mean, it's like a tiny little box, and it's $20,000. So it shows you, you know, Yes, stuff is coming off, things that have been scrapped, but it is still current and flying. And it is megabucks if you want to go poke at them. Yeah, one of the things that also surprised me down in the avionics bay was the lack of a, a network as, as perhaps we see it today. And there was very much discrete wiring, so point-to-point -point cabling, which obviously costs a lot of weight, but it does make it much, much more difficult to attack from any other point in the network. That is the way that Arink 429 networks well, networks were were designed. It's a it's a point to point um, bus, a bit like serial. It has um, a, a twisted pair for transmit and a twisted pair for receive. Um, and often interconnections between um, uh, line replaceable units, LRUs, and um, will be one way. 
Um, so a good example is that the, the flight management computer is continuously computing where the aircraft is um, in 3D space. And it's taking lots of inputs from lots of systems, GPS and navigation beacons and inertial reference units, you know, stuff from a long time ago. But it's amalgamating all of these things to produce um, what it believes is to be the true position of the aircraft. And the FMS will then send that navigational positional data onto other systems. So in-flight entertainment is a really good example. In order to draw the pretty moving map display that lets you know where you are in the world and how um, how long it is left to run to your destination, um, that moving map system needs to take that feed from the flight management system. Now, that does mean that there is a connection between a flight management computer and the IFE, but in older aircraft, that is a one-way connection. There is a transmit pair from the flight management computer to the in-flight entertainment system. There is no way, no literal physical way to go back the other way. So although we're talking about protocols that have no inherent uh, security as we see them today, there's no encryption, and there's no signing, for example, um, there is inherent physical security in that you can't jump from the IFE and suddenly take control of the aircraft. So obviously 49 carries um, a lot of heavy wiring as a result of it. Now, and I know that um, the 777 used an inductively coupled bus called ARIC 629, but that was really only used in the 777 itself. More recently, yeah. we've seen a move towards um, AFDX or ARIC 664. How does that change the risk profile of the plane to you? So 664, and, and aviation loves its acronyms and numbers and stuff. So, but 664 is basically based on um, Ethernet. Um, it is Ethernet with some extra quality of service layers on top to make sure that flight critical things can always talk to each other. Um, so there is basically a fiber network around uh, more recent aircraft like um, the 777X, the 787 and, th and the A380. Um, so there is a fiber network um, and everything plugs into that fiber network. Um, and instead of these discrete um, black boxes that we saw on the 747 and this whole rack of, of individual black boxes for want of a better word, um, then there is basically a, a single compute crate. Well, in fact, there's a pair for redundancy, um, but there's an A side and a B side computer um, and things just run a software. Um, so there's typically um, a real-time operating system like VxWorks that handles the flight critical stuff. And then there tends to be a Linux side um, for um, less important things. And things are just run as applications um, on these computational nodes. Um, so that does mean you start to look a bit more like a traditional um, IT network, um, albeit one that's kind of hardened and um, more resilient in that regard. But yeah, if you don't get things right, um, and I'm sure we've all seen it on office networks and traditional office firewalling. If you don't get IP tables right, then that potentially means that traffic can move from one uh, segmented zone to another. And that, that is true on aircraft. Um, but obviously, you, you're still going to need physical access. Yeah, so that's actually a really point. So we talked there in 49 about you know, primarily the need for physical access. So you have planes being air sides where there is good security um, means that physical access is, is, is perhaps much better than the average office network, perhaps. But do you see that, um, that threat model changing as we start to connect airplanes? So we start to connect airplanes to things like engine monitoring more? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's definitely an advantage into connecting aircraft. Um, to, to the internet. So not only um, for predictive maintenance monitoring that, that we spoke about in the video, um, but um, also for efficiencies in things like maintenance. Um, you know, we saw that the, the navigational database on the 74 that we toured around was updated by floppy disks. And, and one of the issues that's come out of the COVID crisis is that there aren't enough um, maintenance laptops with floppy disks on them to go around and update all of these aircraft that are coming out of storage, which is a positive thing. Um, and wouldn't it actually be easier if we could just press a button on some web app centrally and push out um, a navigation update to all of our aircraft in one go? And then we know what state they're all in and it's easy. We don't have to physically visit. Um, you know, it, it makes 
certain that we're running the same version on all of our aircraft um, and it reduces costs because we don't have to send someone out physically with a laptop and spend two or three hours doing it. Some things that I think I think we noticed from uh, looking at some navigational databases we recovered from our, from airplanes, particularly those on floppies, is there wasn't any code signing, there wasn't any any cryptographic no. um, validity. So again, less of a problem where you're physically having to visit the plane and there's physical security in place. But as we move towards you know, sort of the idea of updating um, remotely over the air, do you think that's more of a problem? Well, where, where manufacturers have moved to this over the air um, deployment model, they have implemented some code signing, um, which has brought it brought its own problems actually recently because that code validity certificate is also only valid for a month. Um, so if you're trying to do um, updates onto an Airbus at the moment, you actually have to update the certificate verification list and the certificate chain before you can do anything else. Um, so they have thought about this as they've started to um, make these E-enabled aircraft, for example. Um, and on, on the Boeing side, um, there are some actual physical data interlocks um, on, on the aircraft. So although you can stage um, software updates um, and navigation updates, for example, onto the aircraft, they are held in an area until um, either a pilot or a maintenance engineer physically operates a key switch and selects where that software update should go. And there are other physical interlocks. So the, the um, aircraft actually has to have its weight on wheels uh, switch closed as well. So the aircraft has to be on the ground, it can't be flying. Um, and someone has to physically operate a mechanical switch um, in order to update that particular part. So there are some safeguards, um, but yeah, you're right. There, there are still um, a great reliance on um, CRCs um, and that kind of thing floating around in the aviation industry. And if you uh, speak to people, that there does seem to be a bit of a misunderstanding between um, integrity um, in that there is some sort of CRC magic number type thing to make sure the message or update hasn't been garbled in transmission um, versus actual message signing so that you know that that um, software update or message has actually come from the person that says it's come from. Now, one of the things that you and I have common, so um, besides being interested in security research, is we're, we're both pilots as well. And that gives me great comfort knowing there's a human, a very experienced human up front, analyzing all the data and making making decisions. But as, as well as you and I all know, from uh, you know, difficult days uh, in, in, in the cockpit when we're flying around and the information overload becomes a bit too much, you can actually start to cause a breakdown. And it, it, it's a, a very bold pilot who can actually go, right, let's stop and start from scratch. Where are we? What are we doing? We aviate, we navigate, and then we communicate. Now, do you think there are opportunities within some of these systems, systems to maybe introduce that sort of confusion that might start a cascade of events? For sure. I mean, there has, in some airlines, um, and some aircraft become an over-reliance on, on what the computers are telling you. I mean, you can see from the A320 behind you and from the 74 that um, we went around that everything is glass cockpit. You're kind of reliant on flying um, the route that the computers have pre-programmed and often that route is sent to you um, by the airline um, over a system called ACARS directly into the aircraft. Now, you do have to check it but there is a big button marked accept. Um, and I guess the temptation can be there um, to you know, not actually cross check and merely just press the button marked accept um, and load that particular um, performance set of calculations or that new route or that new request from air traffic control um, without actually checking it. Yeah, I've certainly made some very uh, dodgy decisions whilst uh, flying myself, including once landing at the wrong airport, but that's another discussion. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I did notice um, looking at our particular uh, cockpit display units, um, whilst talking to a 747 pilot last week, he said, yeah, we'll take the flight plan to ACARS and we we'll usually review it on a primary flight display to see what's going on. But it was interesting to note that on our CDU, the one button that was worn was the same button you pressed to accept the A-class yeah. flight plan. Yeah. So 
there's a lot of connectivity being established on planes and um, a particular technology I've, I'm quite interested in is GateLink, which is used to um, upload and download, for example, pasture and manifest information, but also things like um, movies and stuff. So someone physically doesn't have to put a CD or floppy, crikey, into the uh, IFE. What other things are we seeing connected to planes on the ground? Primarily, it's the, the health and maintenance data um, of the aircraft. So there's this big drive um, from the part of uh, the manufacturers to have literally cloud offerings um, so that you as an operator can see the, the status of your aircraft in real time. Um, I mean, some of it is really cool in that you know, they can even see um, you know, how long it takes an individual valve to open or close that if this particular valve is now taking a fraction of a second longer to open or close than it was, then maybe we need to arrange maintenance to come out and change that valve before you know it becomes a problem and you know, the aircraft requires more maintenance and, and more downtime. And remember that every time the aircraft is sitting on the tarmac, it's losing money for the airline. So um, to keep our fares down, um, you know, we want to maximise how often these things are flying, but in a safe way. That yeah. picks up an interesting piece from a couple of years ago. A security researcher claimed to have accessed the thrush management computer from the in-flight entertainment system. What's what's your view on that? Do you think that was that was um, a real issue, or do you think perhaps the media got a bit excited about it? I, I think it was it was thoroughly investigated by everyone, and and knowing um, the airframe manufacturers, they they do genuinely take reports of this nature pretty seriously. Most of them have avionics um, labs where they have everything in pieces on the bench and they often have a dedicated um, cyber um, security team that can take reports of this nature and actually go and replay them on the bench and, and even on real airframes if, if they want to. So I know it was thoroughly investigated and, um, and kind of debunked at the time. Um, I think it was perhaps a media jumping on the story rather than the individual in that particular case. Um, but as we briefly spoke about earlier, then there, there is ARINC 49 flying around between the flight management system and the in-flight entertainment for um, you know telling you where you are. Um, that's just part of how it works. But that is a warm way system, and and we have found that in in our research. Um, I obviously can't speak as to the exact operator and aircraft involved in that previous instance, but you know, where we've gone deliberately looking, um, we've not found at this point um, any two-way communication between passenger domain systems like IFE um, and the control domain. Um, and, and there is actually this sort of DMZ almost of the information uh, services domain that sits between the two. So to jump between essentially two layers of segregation will be tricky in, in my opinion. Yeah, I, so from everything I think we've looked at, it's, it doesn't substantiate um, some of the claims that we've seen. Certainly, we haven't found a way to compromise aircraft control from the IFV. No, and, and that's not us being complacent either. And it's it's one of these areas that is super interesting to research. Um, just like maritime and automotive, um, they, these systems have taken... Um, legacy protocols like ARIN 49 and CAN on automotive, um, and we are connecting um, insecure by design, basically, protocols. Um, ARIN 49 was designed in 1978. This predates any notion of public key cryptography, for example. Um, so where we have taken um, legacy protocols like this and we are connecting um, these devices to the internet, then we need to keep that in mind and we need to bake in defences when we are doing so. So Alex, where are you, where are you going next with your research? Where, where, where's your hunches, where are your spidey senses uh, telling you to go and look next? Um, well, I think in-flight entertainment is still a really ripe area, um, particularly as it's sort of semi-accessible from the cabin. I think lots of people are interested in that. But actually the, the middle ground, the information services, um, on board the aircraft. Now, these these aren't things that are flight critical. If, if they went away because someone turned them off in flight, then the, the aircraft would carry on flying, but it would just mean it would be less efficient. Um, so it's these areas like the wireless quick access recorders, um, ACARs, um, sort of satcom things, gate link, all of these things are, are really, really interesting. And, and they sit in this middle ground niche area 
and, and things like the wireless quick access recorder or um, digital flight data acquisition unit, um, these have access to a lot of other things on the aircraft, um, just by, by their nature. It strikes me that sometimes we're looking in the wrong place. Everyone gets very excited about airplanes because they're new and unusual technologies. And um, it's, it's great for us inquisitive researchers, but frankly, probably the most likely area to cause disruption is going to be the ground system. So if a plane can't dispatch because the ground systems are down or the maintenance systems are down, it doesn't go anywhere. So I often think that planes get yeah, really interesting and lots of fun. And I think it's great that we can help assure their security, but really you need to watch out for those ground systems, right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it just reminds me of um, flying out to DEFCON almost a year ago um, and a particular airline that pretty much all of us were traveling with to Vegas um, had a massive outage of its passenger information um, system. So none of the check-in crew um, at the airports um, could scan your boarding pass and get you onto the aircraft. They were having to do it like literally pen and paper all by hand. Um, thousands of people um, at this one airport, the queues are out of the terminal around the car park. Um, yeah, and this was global. Um, that's a huge amount of disruption and, and cost. I mean, they did a really stellar job of getting us onto the aircraft in time, pretty much. But you can see just how little things like this um, can have a real snowball effect. But it is interesting, isn't it? Whilst it's, it's inefficient and slow, actually, the fact that there are humans in the loop, I think, is is actually really important. So particularly on a plane up front, you know, there are two or more pilots on an aircraft. And even if the systems are doing weird things, there's still someone there to take over and make sensible decisions. Yeah, I mean, they, you know, for, for performance and, and flight planning, they pretty much always have iPads with them so they could do that. Frankly, they could revert back to paper charts if they actually had to. Um, they, yeah, they should always be double checking um, what is being sent to them as, as a route or changes that air traffic are instructing them to do over ACARs, for example. Um, but then if things don't quite match up, you know, they, they literally can take control of the aircraft, you know, with with the control sticks and yokes and, and fly it by hand. They don't have to rely on, on all the bells and whistles that, that you have behind you. Actually, all they need um, is, you know, a, a couple or three gauges and they, they are trained to fly an aircraft in those circumstances. So um, certainly before the lockdown, I used to fly pretty much every single week. And uh, I don't know about you, Alex, I, I feel very comfortable um, with flying and being a passenger, even fully in the knowledge of uh, how aviation systems work. I'm, I'm very confident in their security. How do you feel about it? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really important that you know we're not here to scare bunga. Um, like any industry, there are areas of improvement and I'm pretty sure they would be the first to admit that but um, do any of these deficiencies mean that it's unsafe for people to fly? No and um, I'm a pilot I want to carry on flying for work um, you know I'm have friends and family flying around so I don't wish them any harm either so no I don't think there are any any risks. Great on that note Alex thank you very much. Cheers again. So thanks for watching I hope it was useful to you if you have any comments or questions, let us know.